we move to Norway. So I would like to welcome PhD candidate, Ms. Haldis Kismul. Um, Haldis is our 11 presenter today, um, the 11 presentation, sorry, the 12th speaker from the ninth country today. Um, Haldis is a PhD student in a joint project agreement between the Nord University in Norway and the Swedish University of Agricultural Science. So Haldis, it's a pleasure having you here today with us. So yes, as uh, mentioned, um, I'm um, I'm at uh, the Faculty of Biosciences of Agriculture and, uh, at Nord University. Uh, we are a very young university, uh, uh, having been merged by a lot of university colleges. Uh, so my uh, division comes from a very practical and applied point of view um, and we're hoping to be able to keep that going forward as a university. Um, yes, uh, Nico already mentioned that as a, I'm, a, I'm a part of a joint study so my some of the research I will be talking about has been conducted in Sweden and some of it has been conducted in Norway. Um, but although we are very, very close, uh, there are some, quite some differences between the agriculture in Norway and Sweden. So I'll just quickly take you through Norway in a nutshell. Uh, we are about half of the inhabitants of Sweden. So we're about 5 million and about 2% of us are uh, directly employed in agricultural employment. Um, but if you expand that into services related to agriculture, such as um, dairy plants and slaughterhouses and uh, services related to this, about 10% of us are uh, dependent on agriculture for our employment. As you see, uh, it, we have a very long country stretching um, from quite far south to quite far north, uh, but our land mass is not so impressive. If we're excluding our territories in Svalbard and Antarctica, um, you can see that we are only just shy of 400,000 square kilometers. Um, and out of this, only just short of 3% is actually agricultural land. The um, majority of our country is either tundra or uh, bare mountains. Um, To the left here, we have the mean temperatures from uh, the years uh, 1961 to 1990. And to the right, I will want to show you the annual um, precipitation, precipitation uh, in the same years. Um, so as you can see, our climate is quite cool and also quite wet. Um, although uh, the recent 15 years, the mean temperature has risen by half a degree across the country and um, uh, precipitation has increased even more. Uh, so we have on average, uh, six, in the north, we have on average six months of the year we are where we are below uh, freezing temperatures. And um, thus our growth uh, season is quite short. Uh, and with harsh climates like this, we will need to invest in quite expensive buildings for our animals. Um, the agricultural conjunctures in Norway uh, are also very small agricultural units. Um, uh, 
uh, we have quite a few agricultural units as there is a political there are political incentives and has been in the, since the 60s to maintain population throughout the length of the country. Um, so like any other industry in our country, there are uh, financial incentives to help being able to maintain industry throughout. But financial incentives cannot, as you all very well know uh, do anything about where land is to be found uh, so although our farms are increasing on average in size um, they are still very quite small um, yeah at in 2018, about 60% of our cows were found in herds between 15 to 50 cows. Uh, and um, the average herd size was about 28 dairy cows, uh, which is has increased quite rapidly. When I first began my PhD studies, we were just shy of 25 cows as the average herd. Um, yeah. Um, the Nor Norwegian dairy farming is very strong on cooperative tradition and we have a very strong protective system, uh, import protection system. Um, this is also maintained by having a quota system where there is a roof of maximum 900,000 litres per farm. Um, which has led to us, although our uh, average milk yields have increased a lot the past 20 years, uh, it is still um, not as high as in our neighbouring countries. Um, the characteristics of our farms, um, well, it's difficult to say what the Norwegian farm really is because it could be a 19, uh, it could be a 19th century um, tie down stall with hand milking. Those still exist where they have three to five cows and um, uh, are still running the farm. Uh, it could be a farm built in the 60s. Uh, which was the last uh, big building boom of Norway. Um, or it could be a state-of-the-art, newly built, um, one-level AMS farm. Or as the quite recent trend is that these one-level uh, AMS farms are built in whole wood. Uh, but Despite this, we could say that the characteristics of our farms are small scale, highly mechanized, and using less hired labor. Uh, we also have a very strong tradition of grazing, although the grazing season is very short. Uh, in most regions, there is still a continuous tradition of transhumance or communal grazing uh, in the summer months. Uh, also, in Norway, uh, grazing is mandatory by welfare legislation, like Eva mentioned that it is in Sweden. Um, the current status of AMS, to start there, we were a bit, the Norwegian farmers were a bit more hesitant than our neighbours to the east. And our first AMS unit was installed only in year 2000. Uh, and as you can see from the graph here, sorry, uh, as you can see from the graph, it's um, it took a couple of years to sort of take off. But then already in 2006, we were above 200 AM units in Norway. And since then, it has increased approximately 200 units per year. Um, so by March 
2019, which is the most recent number I could find, um, the National Herd um, reports that there are more than 1,800 operating AMS, unit, AMS units in Norway, um, leaving an average of 1.1 AMS units per farm. So our AMS farms are quite small. Um, in 2018, the herd, national herd statistics um, showed that 45% of our cows are currently being milked in AMS, whereas they, and these 45% uh, produce 48% of the delivered milk. Um, the typical AMS farm in Norway doesn't really exist. Um, because AMS farms, at first, AMS farms were in the larger herds where they could fill the robot with uh, 50 to 60, we say maximum 60 lact cows in lactation uh, here in Norway. Because, um, but nowadays, even smaller farms, down, I've, I've been to farms down to 22 cows uh, install. AMS. Um, at first, when the robots come came, uh, Norway, because of the um, of the strong tradition of um, of cooperative, uh, most farmers bought from the cooperative um, farming equipment store. And they sell the Laval, and at the beginning we had mostly directed traffic because of that. Now, Lally was quick to come into the market as well, and now recently SAC has also started to enter the market. And we see in all, in farms with all three uh, brands, that is more common with free traffic, also in larger herds. Uh, where we frequently see um, very important cow solutions which are semi-directing uh, low-ranking cows or sick cows or cows that need uh, extra attention in any way to get into the, um, to the robotic unit without being bullied by higher ranking cows. When robots first came to Norway, there was a massive increase in milk yield in the robot farms compared to the existing farms. Now, however, the difference is smaller, and some of that explanation is probably that when they built the robotic farms, it was not just a robot that was changed, but also a lot of other things. Um, Obviously, the milking frequency has increased, um, going from uh, two milkings a day, which has been has been and it still is the tradition in manual milking farms in Norway, to approximately 2.5 as an uh, average of the Norwegian herd. Uh, so, what was the key factors that drove this development? Um, I think Eva was mentioned most of these things in her presentation and uh, the key fact the key drivers here in Norway are pretty much the same uh, in a farm before the second world war uh, there were a lot of hired hands uh, but after after the war the factories needed more hands to work there and could compete in um, compete with salaries and um, there was a drainage of manual labor from farms and technical skills to factories at first and then from the 1960s onwards into the oil industry. Um, this made farming quite a solid, uh, solitary profession in Norway. Uh, from the 1950s onwards uh, and 
not only solitary emotionally, but also solitary in the hard work that I know that you all know farming can be. Uh, so the Norwegian farmers has a tradition of an early embrace of mechanical innovations to ease the work. And then in the 1990s, um, the increased salaries that had st started in 1960s had sort of peaked into a overall increased uh, life standard and life cost level in all of Norway. And um, this also, um, also affected farmers. Uh, not only because of the higher at hand need, and um, there's, there's also due to an increased level of education, uh, all industries experienced that finding manual labor uh, was difficult. Um, and also uh, with increased life expectancy and later retirement age, uh, also for farmers, uh, the generation shifts came later, leaving the new generation time to settle down with a different life prior to uh, becoming farmers and also then settling down to a more normal life system. So um, uh, during the 1990s, the, the demands for a more normal social life for also for farmers became quite evident. Um, and I think that that were like the key, yeah, the key drivers to why uh, robotic milking was so embraced when it then finally came to Norway in the 2000s. Um, the, then in 2004, there was a change in law regarding uh, animal housing, uh, banning the building of new tie down stalls. Um, as most farms, 80% of Norwegian farms at that time were tie down stalls, there was a great need for reinvestment into the agricultural sector uh, and the level up to invest in an AMS was less of a leap uh, than uh, had the farmer, the farms not already had to invest. Uh, this has also been and still is quite the driving force of AMS um, investments. Uh, currently, uh, there are still some time town of stalls. Um, uh, but these will have to be either taken out of business or have been converted by 2034. So there's still so quite a few years to expect a growth. I'm sorry, I see I'm running quite late. Um, then uh, Eva was already touching on quite a a lot of the challenges. Um, I couldn't find any Norwegian statistics on challenges um, in AMS dairy farming, but talking with extensions and services, um, these are this, what all of them are reporting that their farmers are mentioning. Um, the mental stress for alarms is quite a high constant as is the need for computer literacy. Um, also, there's a high degree of uh, working outside of the farm in Norway to be able to make things go around. And a lot of those who had early investment in AMS um, were hoping for having to work less at the farm and um, the experience is that it's not less work with the AMS, it's just a different kind of work. Um, 
Interestingly, we also had a return of a mastoitis bacteria that we thought was extinct in a way. In 2013, uh, Streptococcus lactia came back into the results in the mastoitis laboratories and it started to be so increasingly, increasing mastoitis costs and reducing milk yields. Um, Interestingly enough, this Agalactia seems to be um, behaving differently than previous known um, Agalactia infections. And um, yeah, um, it's not as detrimental as the strep Agalactia that was in Norwegian farms until the 1960s. 1970s. Um, but the main complaint that I've heard whenever I've been, when I was still working in the extension uh, services and I hear from former colleagues in the extension services is the worry about the gra grazing management. Um, the main complaints is either the climate uh, which is either very wet and cold or occasionally very warm and dry um, with there being no tradition of having means to combat the drought. Um, there's also the worry uh, with the high milk yield levels that um, that there's simply not enough food of high enough quality available to the cows on pasture and uh, that with increasing herd sizes and increasing milk yield levels there is an increasing need for pasture areas close to the stable which just isn't there. Um, also there's um, there's a worry uh, either that the cows will not go outdoors while they have the ability to go to pasture and thus you have to contain continue having high feed costs indoors or uh, that um, the cows are too enthusiastic about outdoor life and you have problems getting them to come back in to get milked that the concentrate ration in the robot just isn't high enough allure to bring them back in. It's this last uh, matter uh, that I've been working with in my PhD uh, projects um, to, uh, to combat these worries. Norwegian farmers uh, currently been creative. They've been, sorry, um, they've been introducing zero pasture, which is just basically a pen outside the door, uh, allowing the cows to go out and feel the air and see the sun, but not um, have any soft ground to lay down on or anything to graze on. Exercise pastures, which are basically pastures, green pastures with grass, but they're too small for there to be any food for available for the cows uh, uh, as alternatives to production pastures where uh, which is what we would traditionally call a pasture where a great degree of the daily feed intake comes from grass. Um, this made us wonder whether we could get the same effect as um, having an exercise pasture, like having to offer a smaller area close to the barn could be solved by rather than just opening up the stable doors and allow the cows to go out full time, uh, what would happen if we made grazing and pasture access a, a uh, constricted resource um, that they only had access to parts of the day. Um, we were wondering if it could trust the cows to harvest a sufficient part of the diet 
uh, and if the part-time grazing couldn't be sufficient. And also, uh, if part-time graze is sufficient, which time of the day would work better to offer this part-time? Um, just going through, we had a series of three um, three controlled studies, uh, where one where we offered daytime grazing from six in the morning to six in the evening, uh, one where we offered morning and evening grazing uh, with the cows restricted to the stables midday and nighttime, and one with nighttime grazing with pasture access from six in the evening to six in the morning. In all three uh, experiments, we had two um, experimental groups, production pasture and exercise pasture. Um, and um, what we found is that uh, milk yields did not significantly um, drop in daytime to use, but there was a great difference in how the cows exploited the pasture access. Um, we saw the same uh, results really in the morning evening grazing, although in the morning evening grazing the cows had a higher degree of um, exploiting the time available to them in the production group, whereas in the exercise group the exploitation time was quite exploitation percentages were quite similar, so the total time was lower. Um, whereas in uh, nighttime grazing, uh, we found a significantly lower uh, production for the production group, or milk yield for the production group, and a dramatically lower degree of ex exploitation of pasture time for this group as well. Um, so, our conclusion so far is that it is possible to maintain the same milk yield uh, and it does seem like past time um, restricting pasture access can improve the utilization, but we haven't really found the optimum times yet. Um, I've added some links to um, publications on these if anyone would like to read them. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm running out of time here, I see. Um, we also have an ongoing cohort study where we are trying to um, make learning points of future, of current AMS farmers with grazing for future AMS farms, how to plan better. Uh, and we're working on a computer learning system for increased precision feeding, um, developing a cowside method to real-time determine uh, the dry matter intake of the herd to optimize feed allocation to reduce overfeeding and feed spillage. Um, I added... Um, URLs as well to uh, current and recently concluded uh, AMS projects elsewhere in Norway. Unfortunately, I don't know too much about any of these projects, um, uh, but they are mainly the industry, so the Tina dairy company that are main drivers in this R&D work here in Norway. Um, I'm sorry for going a bit over the time and thank you so much for having me and for your attention. Thank you, Haldis, for that presentation. I think, uh, yes, we are a couple of minutes over, but I think it was a really great overview on not only the dairy production in Norway, but also the challenges that you face and how AMS kind of fits in that scene. And from there, moving into what has happened on adoption and, and the grazing. I probably only have time for one little question that came through. Um, and we have to be really quick with the answer, but is 
Can you tell us about the pasture that those animals were grazing in that last trial? What type of grass was it? And have you tried incorporating forages into grazing? Uh, to the last part, no, we have not tried that yet in experiments in Norway, uh, but we see some farmers adapting that from um, from Denmark and seem quite pleased in areas with not too big problems of um, standing water prior to freezing. Um, the pastures in the the, the project uh, uh, it was a five-year-old in sown uh, pasture so um, we don't have 100% control of what was still in the pasture but uh, sown in it was primarily perennial ryegrass uh, and white clover uh, with um, some other um, perennial grasses as well. So, Excellent. Yeah. Aldis, thank you very much for your time, for the early start and all that insightful information. I do appreciate very much for your time and pulling this together. And it's a pleasure having you on board of this first global R&D showcase. Thank you. No worries. <laughs>